Matteo treads slowly down the stairs. The oppressive air, sticky with the heat of bodies and food and perfume, the gentle roar of voices, music and bedlam, all rise to greet him. He sets his face into what he hopes is an expression of relaxed cordiality, a slight smile, not too forced, a friendly, open demeanour, a countenance of quiet confidence. All its painful odds with the wreck of nerves and confusion that he feels inside. He reaches the bottom of the stairs and the party seems to swallow him, enveloping him whole. The ground floor is heaving with people, spilling out onto the garden patio, the men in brightly coloured shirts, the women scantily clad in the warm May evening. His father has cranked up the surround sound and the place is almost deafening. Returning warm, sweaty handshakes, raising his voice to answer greetings, thumped on the back and clapped on the shoulders. Matteo takes in deep lungfuls of hot, sultry air and gratefully accepts a tall flute of champagne as he tries to negotiate his way towards the relative cool of the garden. The alcohol fizzes in his empty stomach, his nostrils sting with the stench of his father's Cuban cigars and he feels the sweat begin to congeal beneath his collar as he strives to hear what people are saying, straining his voice to answer their myriad questions, to thank them for their effusive compliments. The evening seems to him an elaborate theatre the sole purpose of which is for his parents to show off their son's achievement, their house, their wealth, their perfect little family. The guests are like actors, playing their part as revellers and admirers, even though most of them barely know him or have the slightest interest in diving. His father, surrounded by a posse of his golfing friends and associates, is jovial and solicitous, brandishing his cigar and knocking back the wine, laughing at his own jokes and growing more loquacious with every glass, entertaining his guests with a detailed account of his recent business trip to Cairo. On the other side of the room, his mother stands poised, hand on hip, making little smoky swirls in the air with her cigarette, tall and elegant, amongst a group of work colleagues and luncheon friends in front of the bay window their glasses of red wine luminous in the reflected evening light. His father calls him inside to introduce him to some new neighbours, and Matteo finds himself plunged back into the heat and the noise. As the Winchesters take turn pumping his hand and slapping him on the back and smiling eagerly, asking him about his competition preparation and informing him that their three-year-old has already shown remarkable signs of agility in the field of gymnastics. Matteo drains his glass and accepts a refill from one of the passing waiters. The volume is reaching fever pitch now. Everyone seems to be talking with strange animation and all he is aware of is a mounting feeling of despair. Over the artificiality of the setup, over the high-pitched whine of his mother's voice which towers over the masses, but most of all over the sensation of being an imposter, posing as some kind of sporting hero when in reality he is a nothing, a less than nothing, a piece of scum on this already tarnished earth, a faulty specimen of a human being who should be wiped out, tied down by a rock and tossed out to sea leaving the world a calmer, healthier, cleaner place. Even as he talks, drinks, laughs and greets guests, he feels himself to be sinking so low now that he seems to have reached rock bottom. It is not some dramatic breakdown. Rock bottom is in fact very mundane. It is everything just slightly out of focus an inability to see the point in anything, and only wonder why on earth everything looks and feels so bad, so painful and so wrong. 
He feels stuck somewhere between dead and alive and cannot imagine any place worse. All these people, how can they keep talking, keep smiling, keep laughing? Can't they feel his pain, his sorrow, his despair? Is he that good an actor? He feels so utterly wretched that it suddenly seems impossible that the whole world doesn't stop and suffer with him. On the one hand, he is desperate to keep up the facade. On the other, he is tempted just to walk through one of the conservatory walls and have the sharp, broken shards slash him to ribbons so he can finally look the way he feels. He gazes at Mrs Winchester's painted pink lips, opening and closing, opening and closing. Mr Winchester's deep, booming laugh, the puff-puff of his cigar and his rasping breath. And he wants to shout, Shut up! Shut up! Shut up, all of you! The whole world seems to have become a maze of shifting mirrors in which he wanders alone, looking frenziedly for the exit back into his real life. A life where people have substance, genuine and a whole. But somehow, somewhere, ever since waking up that morning in his trashed room, he seems to have fallen into a nightmare. He wants to escape, wants to blot it all out, wants to sleep. No, not sleep, damn it. What he wants to do is wake up. <laughs>